<coughs> where, you, where you're not going to mark it, but then that will give you an idea of what you can do on the left side. And if you think about the two movements she's done, what movements has she done? What's she done? Internal rotation. Internal rotation and it's and adaptation. Okay, so we'll try the right side again. <coughs> okay, so you can see we stiffer. Uh, so the right side, so we restricted on internal rotation and adducted. Is that uncomfortable? Yeah. Okay, where do you feel it? Here. Alright, now if you just turn around a second. If my patient says she feels it, point to where? Somewhere here. Somewhere there, and she's restricted on that movement, what might it be? So when you think about the movement, she, my patient is internally rotated. Mm. So it might be an external rotator that's tight. Mm. Yeah? Mm. Like I didn't test you on the movement, but if you were tight on the infraspinatus, it might be why she's restricted doing that sort of test. Mm. But also, if it's more here, it might be bicep long head, because that's limiting the movement. Mm. Mm. And also the supraspinatus as well. Mm. Because it's an internal, can you see what I mean? Mm. So you're just trying to work it out in your mind what it could be. Mm. So we know we're restricted, is pulling in here. Um, maybe uh, a bit more work on, on the movements might improve that range and reduce some discomfort. How often would you do that? Well, I guess for a woman, you probably would do it way more than a man, wouldn't you? Mm. Yeah, because of that particular activation of the bra and all the rest of it. Now, just turn around, please. Um, <laughs> this one, over your head. So this one now is abducted with external rotation. How far can you touch? So about there. You okay? That feels okay, yes? Mm -hmm. Or this one? So that's okay, that's way better. Mm -hmm. Which is quite normal. Mm -hmm. You feel anything in here? No. No? Now, if you just turn maybe to the side, like with this one, with the thumb leading, how far up can you go? Feels okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah? This is a problem side, isn't it? Yes. Yeah? Okay, it's just... <laughs> Alright, what about this one? What do you feel? Well, it's fine. Okay, so okay. Maybe what you did earlier was you did already help in it. <laughs> yeah, that sort of thing. Um, but then if you're feeling it, do it in back. But it's important where you feel it in that movement. Does she feel it in the 60 to 110? Because now we think in painful arc. Mm. And if it's that, then we're thinking, is it the super or the bursa? If that makes sense. Mm. I mean, if my patient had pain in that end in that movement, and then let, let me take the weight of the arm. Remember I said earlier? So if I take the weight of the arm and lift it, and she still feels it, then it's probably the bursa. Mm. If there's no pain, it's probably the super. Mm. Yes, you can do it sideline, but maybe just do it in function might be better. Yeah, from that movement. Then I'll have a few little special tests, arm this way, the standard sort of stuff, arm straight. So 30 degrees of horizontal flexion. Imagine you've got a can of water, slowly empty the can. Do you feel that? In here or not? Okay, a little click. So, so hold it, match the pressure. With it, this is with over pressure, match it, do you feel that? Yes. Okay, so that, if it's a yes, it might be more supra from that area. If I brought the arm in, what's this one? If I do that, do you feel that? Not really, okay, but you felt more the empty can with over pressure. So, you know, do I need to do that much more? Probably not. I'm just saying, but it might give you some ideas. So, maybe, and if she has pain at the end, it might be that she's compressing <coughs> the, the supraspinatus. Hmm. If it's not really a C joint, it's not really pointing to this area, it's more around this area, it might be just like a rather than being a bursa, just like an irritation to the, to the super, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's. Um, I'm lying on your left side, facing that way. So let me just show, this is a nice little <coughs> way of trying to reduce some potential impingement in the shoulder. As we're assessing, we are treating. Can you feel this? Can you feel this? And, uh, yeah. You can use my phone if you want. Use my phone. Yeah, use your phone. Just see what it's like. So the, I'm missing one on YouTube. Um, I've got most of what I'm showing you. But um, I think I'm missing this one. Only, only, the only problem is, when I look at it, it's about eight minutes, nine minutes, and I think it's something that's too long for people to actually uh, watch it. But hey ho. So when you're ready, just press it. This would probably be quite good for you. Mm. Yeah? Uh, so when we're looking at the shoulder, if you've got a typical sort of impingement, ouch, it hurts whether it's 60 to 110 or further up. This technique could work quite well. If you're looking at the, the anterior part of the humerus, then 
typically, if it's slightly too far forward, we can measure it if we want to. There's, there's no set measurement as such. There's an appreciation. You could find the acromion. I'm on the acromion. And we're looking at this distance. And this distance from the anterior part of the humerus to this finger, that distance should be roughly one third to the distance of my thumb and finger. And if that's, say, if that anterior humerus is too far forward, and, it's, and you measure it, and you think, well, that looks for like a half a distance. In reality, that humeral head is too anterior. And these te techniques now I'll show you might help that. When we lift the arm forward, when we lift the arm to the side, we, we can measure it. We can say, well, this is 90 degrees, and this is 150 degrees, and all the rest of it. And we can measure it with a goniometer. But for that movement, for that movement of a humerus to abduct, it needs to glide inferiorly. And when we talk about things like glides, spins, rolls, it is what we call accessory motions. So for the person to be able to abduct 90 degrees, which is a gross range, we might need only one to two millimeters of a glide. You as a therapist can only improve it for them. It's hard for them to do it, because once you've lost a glide, you can then get pain. Let me just show you this. If I hold the humeral head with my fingers as light as you can, hold the, the humerus here, and then fingers on the anterior part, as I bring my shoulder of the patient forward, forwards and backwards, look at my fingers, my fingers are, are going to gently glide the humeral head posteriorly, inferiorly, can you see that? So I'm trying to pull it back and down, but I'm not, it's not much pressure here. So I'm gonna pull back and down, so I'm trying to pull the humeral head back and down. Some people, it's like um, the golf ball on a tee, if you play golf, it is like that. You've got a small tee with a large golf ball. It is, it is very unstable, the shoulder. And now and again, as you mobilize the shoulder, you feel the odd click because it's resetted back. It's almost like the golf ball is, is localizing itself on that tee. So I, I never say how many I do. I just do it until I feel I have had an effect. But the most important one is to go this way. And if you look at what I do, because I automatically do this, I will externally rotate the humerus, I will apply a little bit of traction, and as I abduct around the 60, 70, my fingers are going to glide inferiorly as I slowly pass 100, 110, and so on, until I go as far as I comfortably can. If my patient has pain, when I lift, I will only go as far initially as my patient's point of discomfort. So I abduct, I can observe any facial expression, and if it's sore, I will know. So I tend to back off from that. And again, I don't know how many I do, but I will literally do that. But I'm doing all the work, so all this is passive. But I would probably say to my patient, can you help me a little bit, just help me a little bit. Okay, 10, 20, 30%. And then we slowly work on that, so my patient helps me a little bit more, but before I know it, they'll be almost lifting their arm on their own, see that? But she's thinking to herself now, I can do it, and it's not painful, but I'm still mobilizing that shoulder. And that's a nice way, then from there I'd go forward again, let me do it, I'd go forward and backwards, two or three, four times, then I'd come side to side, but there's not much pressure. Whatever pressure you think I'm pushing, think less. On the front, it's light, yes, yeah? And I can do that sort of movement. One technique to finish, start with the arm at 45 degrees, hand around the scap, hand around the anterior humeral head here. I'm going to get my patient, as long as it's okay for them to do this, slowly lift your arm as far as you comfortably can, and I'm going to do it slow, and I'm going to stabilize the scapula, and I'm going to rotate my scap the scapula for my patient. This is a lovely technique, you okay? Yes. Nice and slow, so I can rotate it all the way. And I never have any set numbers. So this is a third time, probably five, six, seven. But never count, just do it until you think it has an effect. If you rely on, I'm gonna do it eight times, I'm gonna do it 10 times, you'd be obsessed with thinking about the number rather than thinking about the, the end result. Okay, good. And relax. Okay, and that's part two of the of the of the techniques. Any questions on that?